Our Daily Bread Ministries Bible Geography expert, Dr. Jack Beck, is back with the Discover the Word group on the Discover the Word podcast to continue to explore the impact of place. Several years ago, I came to ODB with a vision and said, you know, there's something going on here that the church hasn't wrapped its arms around very tightly. I'm going to try to get the church to think more carefully about the geography they have in their Bible uh, and trying to be intentional about having people think about how stories really do have homes in these places. You can't take one of these stories and shift its location and end up with the same outcome. That's a fairly easy door to open and a very long hallway to walk down for the rest of your life, you know, (laughs) in terms of understanding what that relationship is. Yeah, the relationship between an event and where that event happens, the impact of place. And so join us as Dr. Jack Beck takes us to some passages in the Bible and shows us where it took place, helps us better understand what happened and why it happened. Another fascinating set of conversations begins next on Discover the Word. And welcome to Discover the Word, the small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries. On this Discover the Word podcast, our resident Bible geography expert here at Our Daily Bread Ministries, Dr. Jack Beck, returns and continues to explore with us the importance of where, the impact of place. Jack is convinced that location is always a factor and always shapes our understanding of an event, And so for that reason, when God speaks in the pages of Scripture, geography is a factor that we need to consider. And the Bible has geography on virtually every page. So we hope our time with Jack is opening your eyes to something that you need to pay attention to when you read your Bible. At the table with him, or actually on the Zoom call, our regular Discover the Word group members, Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, and Daniel Ryan Day. And this week... We'll be in the New Testament. In our previous podcast, we focused mainly on some Old Testament stories. But we're going to begin this time with the location of where basically the New Testament begins, the birth of Jesus. And where this happens is something the biblical writers stress multiple times. We say important things more than once. You know what I mean by that? Mm-hmm. I don't. What do you mean by that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell my wife I love her every day. I think that's important okay. to say more than once. Yeah. I think as a parent, I have certainly <laughs> said important things more than once. And I'm thinking about one phrase that was drilled into me is that people are more important than things. And mm-hmm. I would say it actually to myself mm-hmm. every time something mm-hmm. that I kind of liked got broken, you know, in our home or something. So people are more important than things, Elisa. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, like yours, Elisa, it's more of a self-talk than stuff to other people because I'm constantly having to remind myself to depend on the Lord mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. Uh, it's not that I think I'm all that in a bag of chips. It's just I tend to be a fixer, and I, so I try to fix things, and, and I just go ahead and start without sitting and thinking, Lord, I need your help with this. Mm-hmm. And so I have to remind myself to intentionally do that because it is important. Yeah, and I like what you just said there, Bill, because you also just repeated to yourself something I'm also guessing you repeat to yourself often. All right, I'm a fixer, so I try to fix things. <laughs> and for me, like, you know, whether it's the Enneagram or a Strengths Finder or something like that, another important thing that I repeat to myself is I know how I'm wired. And as a result of how I'm wired, I sometimes try to do things that I'm not supposed to do or not called to do or stress myself out trying to do things that I should let someone else handle. So those are one of the important things that Mm -hmm. I remind myself of as well, which is whether it's depending on the Lord or depending on others, these are my defaults and they're not always a good thing. Mm. As a Bible geographer, I pay a lot of attention to place and I'm particularly struck when the name of a place gets repeated frequently. And today I'd like to talk about one of those place names that shows up again and again and again in a story where we may not have noticed it, the Christmas story, as it's told by Matthew and by Luke. If we look at those two accounts, we see that the label Bethlehem, or its equivalent town of David, 
is mentioned nine times when they tell the story of Jesus' birth. Hmm. That's amazing to me because it doesn't necessarily jump off the page when I'm reading it. And I for sure am not going to know that that of the 10 times that that place is mentioned in the New Testament, nine of them occur in the context of the Christmas story. So I'd like to explore that with you and, mm-hmm. and see if we can answer the question, why is Bethlehem so important to the Christmas story? Let's do it. Let's start with Luke 2, 1 and 2. Daniel, would you be so kind as to read that for us? I think there's our first answer. I'm looking at these words. These are words I think I had to memorize as a kid. Isn't it um, true? <laughs> Isn't it true? You just say these words so often and they just become almost slogan-esque rather than uh-huh. something that's meaningful. So let's slow down and see what it has to say about where the story's going to happen. All right. So Luke 2, verse 1, in those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was the governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. So there we have city of David and Bethlehem both. And we have the reason, right, why Mm -hmm. Joseph went. It was a legal requirement, right? There was a government mandate, like in the days of COVID, when there were government mandates of the places you couldn't go. This was a government (laughs) mandate of the place they had to go. Yeah. So Joseph's family, extended family, still lived there. He must have had property there. And the census requirement required him to go to Bethlehem. But it doesn't seem like that's an adequate explanation for why the biblical authors repeat Bethlehem so often in this story. So let's keep going. And uh, Elisa, would you read for us Micah 5-2 and see if we can discover another reason why this story had to move from Nazareth to Bethlehem. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me, one who will be ruler over Israel whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Yeah, that's another one of those passages I memorized in connection with Christmas programs as a kid. But how does it help us with the question, why is this story a Bethlehem story? Well, there's a prophecy. So it's something that has been foretold. Micah is a prophet, and that's where we're reading from. And so way back, hundreds of years prior, it was prophesied that out of Bethlehem will come one who will be the ruler over Israel. It seems like in the Old Testament, Jack, that there's a kind of prophecy where it's warning of judgment for the departure of Israel from walking with their God. Hmm. And there are other kinds of prophecies which are promises of better days ahead. And I think uh, the Micah 5 is more in that latter category of, yeah, this is a rough time, but there's a better time coming. Is that about right? Oh, yeah. So well said, Bill. And what it does is essentially gives us a latitude-longitude plot for where to look for those better times to get underway. Yeah? Meaning a geographic place. A geographic place. (laughs) Okay. And so that's where like the prophecy that this messianic king, this messiah and ruler would be born and that he would be born where David also came from, right? So it was like the line of David, but it was also that there's a king coming who will also be the Messiah. So it was like all of those pieces wound up together. When you put those first two pieces of evidence together, that's a pretty good reason for mentioning where this story is occurring. But I'm still pausing at really nine times. I got it after the first one or two. So why are Matthew and Luke continuing to harp away on this idea that Jesus is born in Bethlehem, the town of David? And um, one of the ways as a Bible geographer and interpreter that I like to think about geography is that places contribute feeling to stories. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways they do that is by recalling things that happened in a place before. So when I look back in the Old Testament at the big Bethlehem stories, there are really only two. And they have something in common. At the time of Ruth and Naomi, we're looking at a family in great distress. And the Lord used Bethlehem to provide a solution for that family in need. Hmm. Fast forward, not terribly far, to the time of 
David. And again, we see not a family, but a nation in crisis. Uh, We spoke of it last week when King Saul was stumbling and struggling to be an appropriate leader for God's people. And the Lord sent Samuel to Bethlehem to provide a solution in leadership. This time, he's anointing David as the next king of Israel. And so as an Old Testament reader, whenever I meet Bethlehem, I'm sort of trained to think of it as a place that provides solutions. You see where I'm going with this? Mm. Yeah, I really like that, Jack, because I think one of the things that we've talked about on Discover the Word as a team many times is to try to understand not how to read it through a 21st century filter, but how to read the text with the idea of how the first hearers would have heard it. And I suspect that the first hearers of this story would have reacted very emotionally because of the very things you're mentioning. And for us, we don't go there, and we should. Yeah. And, you know, this may be off base, and you can tell me it is if you want to, for sure. But, you know, I think I learned that Bethlehem means house of bread. And I'm thinking about where you're pointing us to in terms of the layers of Bethlehem in Scripture. And I'm thinking about the story of Ruth and how she was gleaning in a field the wheat for Boaz. And then I'm thinking about Jesus, who became the bread of life for us. There's something interesting in that, maybe? Yeah, I think so, Elisa. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's all these different layers to the story. So you have theological reasons for why the Messiah would need to be born there prophetically. Then you have this kingship line that he continues in, being born of the house of David in the city of David. And then you have the emotional story that's happening, which is this is a place where God provides help for his people. And then Elisa, like you're talking about, there's like this other metaphorical lens to mm-hmm. Bethlehem as well of that kind of reinforces God's provision for his people when they're in crisis or in need of help. Yeah, it's like we saw in a couple of the locations we visited last week with you, Jack, something about those places make us look backward and make us look forward. Mm-hmm. And, and I think, Daniel, that's exactly what you're getting at. We look backward mm-hmm. and we see Ruth and we see David, but we look forward. Mm-hmm. And to Elisa's point, we see bread of life. And mm-hmm. Bethlehem becomes the hinge pin for all that. A foundation piece for me in reading any Bible story is the realization that that story can be told in more than one way. And what I love And what's so powerful for me is that the Spirit leads these writers to compose these stories in specific fashion. And so when I see a point of emphasis like Bethlehem, I'm going, yeah, that story didn't have to be told in that way. So what did that story do for me because it's being told? in that way. And I think it's a story not only about a political necessity of going to Bethlehem for tax census, it's not only a theological necessity of seeing that this prophecy in Micah is fulfilled, but it also imbues this story with this connotation of, ah, the solution we've been waiting for. And I got to tell you, There's a powerful moment that I had on my last visit, uh, one of my last visits to to Bethlehem, because I went with uh, one of my dear Bethlehem friends to a place in the Church of the Nativity that I had never had the chance to be before. You know, they're sort of public places, and they're places that you aren't allowed to go. And the Church of the Nativity is a very popular place because it remembers the location uh, where the Christ child was born. Well, my friend took me up into the bell tower of that building, And what I was able to see from there is not something that's so easily seen from the ground. And that is that the church that commemorates the birth of Jesus is constructed in the shape of a cross. And so it has Jesus' crucifixion in view as it celebrates the moment of his birth. And I tell you, that's the solution. That is the solution that Bethlehem really delivers in my life. An intriguing look at why Bethlehem is important not only to the Christmas story, but to the whole of Scripture. As Jack said, in all the stories set in Bethlehem, it is a place that provides solutions, culminating, of course, in the ultimate solution, Jesus. Well, this is the Discover the Word podcast with Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, Daniel Ryan Day, and special guest, Dr. Jack Beck. And you know, Jack is such a deep well when it comes to the geography and history of the land of the Bible. 
He has led numerous tours of Israel and is also on the faculty and teaches field study classes in Israel at Jerusalem University College. And after we had that last conversation about Bethlehem, uh, we got a bonus bucket of info out of that deep well about the Church of the Nativity there in Bethlehem. Listen to this. It, the church has such a fascinating history, right? It's the oldest surviving church in the Holy Land. It's a neat piece of architecture. Mm-hmm. And I don't know when the last time was that you were in there, uh, those of you who've had a chance to be in Bethlehem, but they have restored the beautiful artwork on the walls hmm. and uh, and done restoration on the floor as well. And just, wow. When was it built? Remarkable. What year? Uh, The church itself. So it was built in the 4th century. I think it was dedicated about 334 by Queen Helena, the wife of Constantine. Uh, That church was destroyed uh, in about 539, Samaritan Uprising. And then the church itself um, was rebuilt late in the 6th century by Justinian. And um, do you know the story of the of the facade and the wise men? It's such a fascinating. It's a it's it's actually retold in one of the church councils. That's how we know the story. But when the Persians invaded 614 A.D., they destroyed most of the Christian churches in the Holy Land. That's when the Byzantine churches were destroyed. But when they came to Bethlehem, on the facade of the church was a mosaic depicting the wise men, and the Persian attackers saw that mosaic, saw themselves in the art, and said, Mm. pass. We're going to let this building alone. And so uh, as a consequence of the art, the building was preserved. And actually, that story was preserved because there was this discussion about whether or not art was appropriate in a church building in one of the early church councils. And this story was quoted in support of of the art. Isn't that an an interesting story? Yeah. So in the church itself... You have evidence on the floor, the mosaic floors of the uh, 4th century church, the mosaics. Uh, The floor level was raised for the 6th century church, so we are walking above that earlier floor, but most of the primary architectural components in the building are 6th century. So it's it's an amazing piece of history to walk through. And that's what you get when you're with Jack Beck. Pretty amazing. His passion for making Bible geography meaningful is pretty hard to resist. Well, in this next part of our conversation with Jack, he's going to take us to one of his favorite places to explore. But in Bible times, was it a place where you went to have fun and relax and enjoy yourself? Well, let's find out. You know, I absolutely love the wilderness. If I have a choice, I'm not sitting at my desk, but I've got a backpack on and I'm wandering uh, in the back country, exploring the natural world. I'm wondering if you guys share that passion with me or find that to be absolutely crazy. I do share that passion, Jack. I love sitting in the woods. I love hiking. I love fishing and hunting and being in the wilderness as well. So I'm right there with you. Mm. I love the outdoors as well, uh, but not so much the wilderness as much as I do golf courses. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) So if I'm outdoors, I don't have a knapsack or a backpack, but I do have a golf bag. (laughs) Yeah, I love that, Bill. And I was thinking there's a difference between the outdoors and wilderness. And and honestly, you know, I live in Colorado, and so our wilderness is really beautiful. But I spent quite a bit of time in the desert in California. I have spent a lot of time there and it has its own beauty, but you can experience the danger of the wilderness uniquely. I guess kind of like you can in the, in the winter in Colorado, you know, the, the summer in California desert. I mean, I think I was there one time and it was 124 Whoa. degrees. You know, it's just, it's oppressive. So outdoors versus wilderness, maybe there's a difference between the two of those for me. <laughs> oh, I think yeah. so. I think you're onto something, Elisa. <laughs> it's one of the places I'm challenged as a lover of wilderness when I read Bible stories about wilderness because the people who were living in Bible times thought about wilderness in the polar opposite way that I do. Uh, Wilderness was not something to be engaged and enjoyed, but something you would avoid at all costs. Mm. 
Mm. It's interesting when you look at ancient travel narratives, people would go miles and miles out of their way to avoid these wilderness areas. And it's because a biblical wilderness is a place that has an extreme shortage of all the things that human beings need to survive. Mm-hmm. And that brings us to the story that I'd like to look at with you. It's in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. Bill, would you be willing to read that for us? Sure. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So, you know, I'm a Bible geographer, and so the question I always ask when I can land a story in a place, what is that place contributing to that story that I may not have noticed before? Mm -hmm. So let me take the question to you. As you read those verses, heard those verses read, what is there about wilderness that you see contributing towards this story? Well, one of the things you've been teaching us to do is to look for other times that that kind of thing appears. And it seems to me, Jack, that uh, there are a number of times in the scriptures when God wants to do some training Hmm. with an individual, that that training takes place in the wilderness, whether it was Moses or Elijah or uh, Paul uh, in the New Testament. And of course, John the Baptist, all of those guys spent time in the wilderness getting ready for the task that God was going to call them to. And is there a specific place that would be the wilderness, or was it just anywhere in different places for all of the examples we see in the Bible? Yeah, the word wilderness really defines an ecosystem. And then you've got some proper names that are used to describe different specific locations where we'd find that ecosystem, the wilderness of Sinai, the wilderness of Zin. This particular story, a little farther north than those that are all in the Sinai Peninsula, this I would put in the Judean wilderness, which runs for about 60 miles north and south just to the west of the Dead Sea. Mm. Uh, This story is occurring right after Jesus' baptism. It's what precedes this. And uh, so I think putting him in that area, the northern part of that Judean wilderness is where I'd land this story. And it's a rough place to live. I mean, it's a place where I take people for hikes because I love being out in this place, but it isn't a place we stay overnight. I have stayed overnight. I should say that. I have camped out overnight in that wilderness, but I would never think of taking a group and doing that. There's just not enough food. There's not enough water. There's still Iranian wolves that spook around that uh, area. So there's nighttime danger in that place. And if you look at this story told in four verses, there's a lot packed into that. And here's what you and the listeners may not have noticed. This story is told in such a way as to demonstrate that Jesus put himself in exactly the same position that ancient Israel was in when they were out Mm -hmm. in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And there's a number of details like that, like Jesus and Israel were both led by God into this ecosystem. They both arrived in the same type of landscape, even though the the proper name was different for where Israel was and where Jesus Mm -hmm. was, it was the same ecosystem. Each spent a period of 40 there for Israel, 40 years, Mm. Jesus 40 days. Each was overwhelmed by hunger in this place. Uh, Not enough water, a poor soil quality, you can't grow grain out there. They were hungry and they were consequently faced by the same question. The father turns to Israel in the past and to Jesus in his moment and says, Hmm. will you trust me? Will you trust me when the fundamentals for your survival are not in view? How did Israel do? Wow, (laughs) not so great. (laughs) Although 40 years is a lot different than 40 days, but still. Yeah, they did a lousy job of it. I wouldn't have done any better. I mean, I might not have lasted 40 minutes, Mm -hmm. let alone 40 years. Yeah. I absolutely agree with you. And yet the story is there. We see that God provided for them the water, the manna that they required on a a daily, weekly, monthly basis. And yet they really struggled 
to own the sword of trust uh, that the Lord mm-hmm. looked for in them. I don't know that you can come to any other conclusion than the one that Moses came to, and that was, yeah, we just didn't get this right. We failed out here. Mm-hmm. And so the question is, who can get this right? Mm-hmm. And I love what Romans 5.19 says, For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, get ready, here it comes, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Now that's sort of ethereal and non-tangible, but what I see in this story is an illustration of exactly what Paul is talking about in Romans. What did Jesus come to this earth to do? He came to put himself in exactly the same circumstances we find ourselves in, whether ancient Israel in the past or me in the present. And then when he was tempted in every way, just like we are, he succeeded Hmm. where we fail. And it's this powerful story then, not only about what to do when faced by temptation, because even though Jesus gives me this wonderful example of what I can do to succeed, I still fail. He comes alongside me and says, I got this. I'm going to do this for you. And my salvation is built on nothing less than Jesus' experience in the wilderness where he succeeds, where I fail. Jack, as you talk about that, when you look at the wilderness experience of Israel and the context of that as this new national entity, and then Jesus comes in and succeeds where they fail, a lot of theologians seem to to think that this kind of pictures Jesus as the new Israel or the complete Israel or the representative Israel or something like that. Is that how you're seeing it as well? I think I would broaden that out, Bill. I think I would see him as a representative for all humanity. Okay. And so I see Jesus using this as an exemplar of what he came to do. I have come to put myself in a scenario, in a situation where people of the past were not successful, and look what I'm able to do. I'm able to succeed where they fail. And it becomes then a trajectory into my life that says, yeah, where you fail and where you feel that stumble, right? I feel that powerful solution. I mean, if I only look to Jesus as an example of how to live, I think I'm to be terribly pitied. Certainly he is that. But if that's all he is to me, is here's an example of how to live well, I'm not going to go to sleep well at night because I never live up to the standard. I'm always coming up short. Mm -hmm. And the wonderful news of the gospel, captured in Romans 5.19 and illustrated in Matthew 4, is that Jesus can put himself in exactly the same scenarios and succeed where I fail. Yeah, where we fail... Jesus succeeds. The impact of place, the impact of the wilderness. You're studying on the Discover the Word podcast with Lisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, Daniel Ryan Day, and our special guest for this series, author and scholar, Dr. Jack Beck. Uh, Back with more after this message. Now, if you're enjoying this series of conversations with Bible geography expert, Dr. Jack Beck, And I think you'll also be interested in a series of videos on our Our Daily Bread Ministries YouTube channel in which Jack connects the land and what God is saying in the stories of the Bible. Some of what God has had to say to us, he's chosen to say with geography. And uh, whether or not we engage it, uh, that makes a huge difference sometimes in the stories that we read. And I hope Mm -hmm. uh, the stories that we look at shine a new spotlight on the way God uses place to speak to us. You'll find a link to where you can watch these videos on our discovertheword.org website or just type Our Daily Bread YouTube channel into the search box on your web browser and you'll have access to these intriguing videos with Dr. Jack Beck. And now back to our conversations about the impact of place on the Discover the Word podcast. Some time ago, I had one of those experiences that you just wish you didn't have to have in life. Mm. Uh, One of my friends and colleagues uh, at Jerusalem University College, where I have taught for so many years, he passed away due to complications from COVID. And it really Mm. hit me hard because he's a young guy, you know. I think death is hard anyway, and Mm -hmm. death in young people is even harder for me. Oh, I so agree. Yeah. 
I've shared before that we lost our grandson, Malachi. Mm. Um, he came from his mother's womb straight into heaven and, mm. you know, almost ready to grow and be a running child in this happy world. But uh, being in the presence of life and death together is sacred, holy, mm. and very sobering, very powerful. So mm. I hear it. I'm sorry for your grief, Jack. I hear that. In many ways, the year 2020 was a year of death ever being before us in some ways. Mm-hmm. And there's an ancient church practice, actually, of keeping death ever before us, of being reminded that we're dust and to dust we will return Mm. because of how much it changes our perspective on life. Yeah, Ernest Hemingway, I think it was, who said, every true story ends in death. Mm. Mm. And um, all of us are living true stories, which means we have that same appointment that everybody else does. And when it really hit home for me was when my father died. Uh, I was only 28 years old. He was only 58 when he passed. And, you know, I look back and I think, you know, he only saw one of his grandsons. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's why the story that we want to look at today is looked at so affectionately by the readers of the Bible because um, it shows Jesus not only confronting death, but having the power over death death. It's the story of the raising of Lazarus in John chapter 11. There's a pretty long lead-in backstory to this. Uh, Jesus was not with the family when Lazarus died. He was some distance away. So he arrives on the fourth day after Lazarus passing. Martha, who is the sister of Lazarus, who had passed away, uh, and she was at home receiving uh, the support of family and friends. When she heard Jesus was on the way in, she didn't wait for him to come. She dashed out to meet him on the road into Bethany, and, and that's where I'd like to begin, because Jesus says something to her that echoes throughout time and into our lives about what he can do when confronted by death. Let's take a look at it together. I'd like you to listen carefully both to what Jesus said, and Daniel, if you would be so kind as to read that. Okay. But most importantly, I'd like you to listen to what we don't always pause at, and that is Martha's response in the 27th verse. So, Daniel, if you could start with 25 and maybe Elisa pick up with 27 for us. It'd be great. Yeah, so this is right after Martha almost accuses Jesus. If you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And just a word on that. I think what she's doing there is echoing what she's been hearing in the house because it shows up later Mm. in the chapter as well. It's like, this is really bothering me, Lord. You know, the people yeah. who came to comfort me were actually stirring this notion in me. So she is not one to sit back anyway, and this apparently yeah. has her pretty animated. Apparently she and Mary have been saying it back and forth to each other as well. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it's really a pain-filled kind of statement. Yeah. Mm. yeah, and Jesus responds to her in verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And then in verse 27, Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is come into the world. There are two really powerful theological points packed into those three verses. First of all, Jesus says, I have the power over death. Mm -hmm. And then Martha says, in response to the question, do you believe that? She says, I believe I'll have met the Messiah when I believe that person who has power over death. In other words, yeah, I believe you have the power over death because you are the Messiah. Okay, Jack, let me interrupt you just a second. You're kind of throwing me a curveball because when I read verse 27, it just sounds like she's agreeing with him. It doesn't sound like she's setting a condition for agreeing with him. So how do you get that out of that? Is there something in the... Let me piggyback too. I'm wondering if she's going, yeah, that's why I said if you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. You could have kept him from dying. Is that what she meant? So first of all, to Bill's point, I didn't intend it to be conditional. I simply was trying to reflect how did people, and Martha certainly represents the ordinary folk. She is not the theologian of Jerusalem. She is the ordinary 
folk and how does she think she is anticipating that when the messiah comes she will see something like this so it's interesting to me that her response is not yes i believe that you can raise the dead it's yes i believe you're the messiah and that's a pretty powerful theological declaration so i didn't intend it to be um, okay to be conditional. I probably just misunderstood. Yeah, I may have said it in a way. That, and to Lisa's point was, is he responding to the question? I think he is, at least in part. But he's saying to her, your scope is too narrow, <laughs> right? You're thinking my timing is bad because I'm too late. And I'm going to show you that the timing doesn't matter. I'm here. Uh, yeah. I'm here. Yeah, that's yeah. good. What I'm caught up on, though, is all of these conversations, you've been pointing us to a place and we're talking about these theological ideas in these verses, but does the place have something to do with the story? Is that why you're drawing it to us? Or like, what's the geography have to do with the story? Yeah, thanks for making sure that we get there, Daniel, because this isn't the first time Jesus has raised the dead. Let me use that as a way we get there, right? Right, sure. So, do you know the other two times? Well, he raised the widow's son. And Jairus' daughter. And Jairus' mm-hmm. daughter. So we've got two events like this before to which people would have reacted in a way that was similar to the way Martha is. So my question is, what's different about this? Uh, John gives this an entire long chapter. So we think we have to ask, what is there that's different about this? And I think there are two things that we can point to here. One of them is the timing of the uh, resurrection miracle. And the other, Daniel, is the location. Okay. So let's handle the timing first. Within the Jewish world of the first century, there was no embalming. There was no mummification, as there was in Egypt. So the day of your death was the day of your burial. And so that leads us to realize that every other event that we've talked about so far, Jesus brought someone back to life on the same day they died. Mm -hmm. Okay. And here's an interesting Jewish folk tradition that informs the timing of this miracle because it's emphasized it happened four days after his death. Within the Jewish folk tradition, it was believed that the life force remained around the corpse for three days. And there were some examples of people who were restored to life, perhaps because they were in deep coma, came back to life. And so there was a lot of caution in making sure on day three that that person hadn't revived in the tomb. Mm -hmm. But by day four, hope is surrendered. So that timing is different than the other miracles. Is there also a timing factor, Jack, in the fact that the other two took place rather early in Jesus' public ministry, and this takes place right before his Passion Week? I think absolutely that's true, Bill, because that's really the lead-in. We are walking right into Passion Week with this, aren't we? Okay, okay. Now, Daniel's going to be mad if I don't say something about the place, right? right? (laughs) (laughs) Well, here's what I love about this story is that place is mentioned twice within the context. Uh, So clearly this is important to John as he tells this story as well. And it also marks one of the other significant differences between this story and the earlier stories of resurrection Mm -hmm. in in the life of Jesus. You have this occurring in Bethany. The other two stories are Galilee stories. They're they're far to the north, well out of range of any eyewitness reporting that could easily be done in Jerusalem. Bethany is just 1.75 miles from downtown Jerusalem of the first century. And that means that this event not only is going to travel quickly into the heart of Jerusalem, but it'll be investigatable by anybody who hears it. They're going to be able to take the short walk over to Bethany and interview the principals. Mm. So this story is different than the other stories, both because of the timing and because of the place. And that's why we see in the end of chapter 11 of John, (laughs) there's a plot to kill Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to have two reactions to this story, and they're both Jerusalem reactions. Mm. And that's the geography that I wouldn't want folks to miss. We have moved Jesus' ministry closer to Jerusalem. A miracle closer to Jerusalem like this is going to not only gain a large audience, it's going to gain a powerful response. And the one that isn't reported on in so much detail 
is the people who come to believe mm. in Jesus as the Messiah, as the Savior. Remember Martha's words, right? Mm-hmm. When I meet that person who raises the dead, I'll know I'm in the presence of the Messiah. This is now a Jerusalem story. And many came to know Jesus as their Savior, and they become the anchor of the early Christian church in Jerusalem. Hmm. This is that, that moment, I think, where we see an expansion mm-hmm. of that community. But there's another response, right? Mm-hmm. And that's the one you referred to, Elisa. How did the Jewish leadership feel about this? Yeah, this is in verse 46 of chapter 11. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. And then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting and on we go. Yeah, this was the moment where they realized, like, we can't let him hang around anymore. Mm-hmm. We're going to have to actually kill him to get rid of him. And Daniel, do you see the geography? When Jesus did this in Galilee, the response in Jerusalem was, huh. Yeah. Hmm. As soon as you put it in the environs of Jerusalem, now we got to do something. So the geography isn't just incidental to the story. It's integral to the story because it creates the local reaction. And sets the stage for the passion of Christ. And it's such a good example of what I really have as a mantra of my work as a biblical geographer. If we treat stories as sort of aspatial things that can be moved around on the map without consequence, we miss the point. Stories have homes. This story is a Bethany story that consequently becomes a Jerusalem story that animates the story as it goes forward, both in the Christian community in Jerusalem and in the response to Jesus that will end in his death. It's not a location incidental to the story, but integral to its telling. You know, I go to Israel to study its stories, but the story that I end up experiencing most often is a story about a meeting place. And that meeting place is a coffee house. I have Israeli friends. And if there's one thing you learn very quickly about Israeli culture, it's that you can never have a meeting unless you're in a coffee house. (laughs) See, Jack, I feel like that's why you and I just relate so well, because that's millennial culture in the U.S. too, right? Like when we meet friends, we meet them at coffee shops. I mean, that's one of the most common places. So it's the same kind of thing. (laughs) Lots of times when we're in virtual work, we'll go to a coffee shop in order to meet with other people just for people. But I'm actually thinking about an annual gathering that I have with four other friends. And we go to one of them has a family. It's kind of like a ranch, but there's no animals on it. I don't know Mm. what you call it. It's in Texas. And we always go and the place pulls us to it. We have a Mm. certain place we pull our chairs up around a fire and we talk and we always go back to that place every morning with our coffee. We're there every lunch. We're there every dinner. That place holds us and every year we return to it. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I did a lot in uh, doing one-on-one mentoring or discipleship with guys in the church was the only way you could get any time alone with them was to play golf. Mm. And there's one particular golf course where this one guy and I met every Tuesday morning for about five years. And we would play golf and spend four hours talking about the Bible. Mm. And it was just one of the most enriching times for me. I mean, I don't know if he's any good for him or not, but it was really good for (laughs) me. And every time I think about Big Bend Golf Course, I think of Rodney Mm. and those (laughs) times that we spent there together. Mm. I love it. You know, as a geographer, I know that geography is capable of either creating meetings between people or isolating people from one another. Mm, And um, that's good. What what I find is interesting is that uh, in the land of Israel, there's a meeting place that's sort of predetermined by the geography. It's called the Shephelah, the humble hills, the foothills to the central mountains. Let me give you a a little bit more help with that. Uh, Israel itself changes in its appearance frequently over the miles. It's one of the things that surprises people most often when they travel there. Right down the center of the country, you've got a set of mountains that runs north and south. Western part of the country, you've got a coastal plain that runs north and south. And by their very nature, they tend to isolate people from one another. Uh, The mountains have their own culture and lifestyle. The coastal plain has its own culture and lifestyle. And in Bible times, it looked like this. God's people of the past to whom he revealed himself, those were the Israelites who lived up in the mountains in Jerusalem. And the world 
Those who were not privy to these insights were out on the coastal plain, and those two tended to orbit in separate environments from one another. When there was a meeting, it occurred through the foothills. That's where the topography turned east-west, and so the Shafela, or these foothills between the mountains and the coastal plain, becomes a meeting place. And so whenever I encounter a story that is occurring in this part of Israel, I ask the question, all right, how'd the meeting go? (laughs) And when I read the Old Testament, I often come to the answer, well, that meeting didn't go very well. We talked about one of those last week, right? A story of David and Goliath. How did that meeting go? (laughs) Well, it didn't go so well for Goliath. (laughs) That's for sure. (laughs) And I bet Saul honestly felt like it didn't go very well Uh, because from that point forward, he loses a lot of his influence. That's true. It's an invasion story, right? And so it's really not a story where the people in the mountains are revealing the insights God has given them to the people on the coastal plain. It's It's a battle story. So, you know, in terms of the divine intention for this meeting place, it didn't go well. There's another story that I think comes to mind pretty quickly, and that's the story of Samson. That was a Shephelah mm-hmm. story, too. How did that meeting go? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that one didn't go so well for Samson, but you're right. I mean, he was supposed to be a judge of Israel, and yet he continually was getting into inappropriate relationships mm-hmm. with Philistine women who were from the coastal plains, and it was not working out. Yeah. yeah. And Jack, there's so many aspects of Samson's story. Is there a particular part of his story where that was the meeting place, or did most of the story happen in the Shephela? Like, how, what yeah, part if, of his story happens there? If you read that story, Daniel, you're going to see yourself running up and down the Sorek Valley, uh, which is one of okay. the valleys mm-hmm. of the Shephela. The story just moves back and forth and back and forth Got it. in that story. So maybe somebody will prove me wrong in this, but every time I read a story in this meeting place— In the Old Testament, it turns out to be just a horrible meeting, a meeting gone awry in some fashion. And so I leave the Old Testament, and I don't really come into the New Testament thinking it's a place where good stories are going to occur. And that's what's so striking to me about the story we're going to look at today. It's a story told in the latter part of Acts chapter 8, a story in which Philip meets the Ethiopian eunuch in the Ela Valley. Now, you may be quick to point out, wait a minute, and <laughs> see the label <laughs> Ala Valley anywhere in there. So let's get the geography right first, and then let's talk about how the meeting went, shall we? Okay. Acts 826. Bill, would you be so kind as to read that? That'll give us the geography for this story. Sure. Acts 826. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise, Go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. Yeah. So there it is, right? And it's plain as day. (laughs) Right. Except it's not. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, right. Except it's totally not. I think it'll be plain as day as soon as you explain it. There you go. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You know, sometimes geographers have an easier job because the label Bethlehem is right there or the label Bethany is right there in the story. Mm -hmm. And we go, yeah, we can zero right in on it. This one makes us work a little harder because we have to understand the transportation corridors of the ancient world. So we've got a couple of places mentioned. We have Jerusalem mentioned. And then we have Gaza mentioned, which is out on the coastal Mm -hmm. plain just before you get into the Sinai wilderness area. So what we need to do is use what we know about ancient road systems to connect those two places. And what we find is the most likely road that would have been used is the one that runs south on the ridge down through the Ela Valley, the same valley where David and Goliath uh, had their exchange then out on the coastal plain to Gaza, and then into the desert. And I think that's the way this is called the desert road. So often in the Bible, Mm. roads are given names based on where they're Mm. going. And so even though the road is not traveling through the desert, when we enter this story, that's the direction that the road is going. Uh, so again, it's just... Like the Jericho Road. Like the Jericho Road, or uh, if you're in uh, modern Jerusalem... 
Or the Jaffa Gate, right? Uh, yeah. It's the gate you go right. out to get to a place. Or the Damascus Gate, it's the gate you go out to get to that place. So um, again, it requires just a little bit more limberness in us Western readers to understand how somebody from the Middle East would engage the story. So what that geography does is it tells us this is going to be a Shafela story. And almost immediately I recoil from it and I go, oh no, because... Something bad's going to happen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> every mm-hmm. yeah. time I've read one of these Shafela stories, it just goes off the rails. So let's explore a little bit together how the meeting went this particular time, starting with the Ethiopian. What do you know about this gentleman? Well, he's from Africa, Northern Africa, and he was well-educated because in this story he's reading, and that means he's had a hand in education. And he's probably reading in Greek. Uh, He's probably reading the Septuagint, so that means he's multilingual. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's good, Bill. Mm -hmm. And honestly, if up to this point, all I've known him as is the Ethiopian eunuch. And wasn't a eunuch, sometimes it was a a physical eunuch, but sometimes it was just a title for an official position, which may be more the case here. Hmm. And where's he coming from? Well, he's coming from Jerusalem, going back home to Africa. Yeah. So it suggests, and given what he's going to be reading in a moment here, this is someone who is a God-fearer, someone Mm -hmm. who is not Jewish, but who has come to embrace the Jewish faith and hope. And he had been in Jerusalem worshiping. Likely the, you know, the best place for him to get answers to the questions he had about the Old Testament text that he was reading. And so as he's bouncing along, right, down this road towards home, he's reading a portion of the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah. And it's a beautiful portion of Isaiah. I think we should read it to appreciate where he was. Daniel, would you be so kind as to pick that up for us? 832 would be great. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. Now, sitting on this side of the cross, we very quickly see, well, this has got to be talking about Jesus, because it's giving this beautiful Old Testament picture of who Jesus would become when he arrived here on earth. But for this poor man... Uh, that language was not ringing clear at all. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, if we're honest, like when we first came to faith, this was not clear either. We've just heard language like a sheep that was led to the slaughter enough times Mm. that we think of it as Jesus. But I'm guessing even people at this point in history were looking at these words, just like we do sometimes going, ooh, is that really what it's talking about? Yeah. And there's something else about the frustration we're going to feel in just a moment in his question that I think comes right out of his life's experience. What job does he have? Well, he's some kind of a financial guy. It says that he worked in in the a treasury. Let's see, that's in verse 27, in charge of all the treasury of the queen of the Ethiopians. Yeah. I don't know what your experience has been with people in the financial world. I have family members who are accountants. And what I know is, one and one always adds up to two. And they get very frustrated when they look at something and it puzzles them. Mm-hmm. And that's where he is. And so Philip comes alongside and says, I hear you're reading. Must have been reading out loud, right? Yeah. And he says, uh, so you understand what you're reading there? And you can almost feel the emotion in the language How in the world could you expect me to understand this unless someone explains it to me? Mm -hmm. And what happens next is the powerful Shephelah moment that we've been waiting for throughout the whole Old Testament. Come to verse 35. Would you please read that for us, Bill? Sure. Acts 8.35, And Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. Hmm. I don't know. Maybe it's just a geographer thing. (laughs) But I feel this big sigh of relief. Because, you know, when I'm in Israel, I don't have the luxury of telling the story of the Bible chronologically. I have to tell the story of the Bible geographically. Because if I told the story of the Bible chronologically, I'd be constantly returning to places I had been before. So I go to a place and I pour out all the stories, right, that are in that region. 
This is one of those places where I go, I just don't have a really good story until right now (laughs) about this region. And it's such a redeeming moment for me as a Bible geographer to see a place finally live up to the divine design plan. God intended the Shephelah to be the place where the world traveling the coastal plain, would meet the revelation he gave in the mountains. And every Old Testament story falls short of that. This story gets it right. We have a Shephelah story where the Lord's truth not only extends to somebody, but somebody from a very faraway place, from Africa. And the Christian church becomes planted in Africa in this story. And wow, you talk about a Shephelah story that's a success story. Hmm. Here's a meeting that went really well. Yeah, it really is encouraging to see how God redeemed this place, a place that until then had never fully realized what God intended for it. But now, through Philip, God uses the Shephelah to plant the church in Africa. Finally, it's a place where the message of God's love and rescue is shared. Well, you're listening to the Discover the Word podcast, and we will wrap up our time with Dr. Jack Beck in just a moment. And in that last conversation, Jack gets a little more aggressive with us. It's the last in this series, so I thought we'd take on the challenge of not just looking at one place, but seeing how a story actually goes on the move between three locations. So this is the impact of places, not the impact of place. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) Yeah, that after this word about our next podcast. On the next Discover the Word podcast, Bill Crowder will take the group to Psalm 34 for some conversations about when crisis strikes. Times of crisis are really challenging to us because they impact us in almost every part of our lives, emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually. And so I guess it's important to ask, are you in a time of crisis right now? It may be a crisis in your marriage or with a child or at work or with your health. Are you going through a time of crisis now? If you are, I think Psalm 34 has something to say to you. And if you aren't, Psalm 34 really has something to say for you because you will be in a crisis. And uh, some wisdom from the scriptures might be just what will help you when that time of crisis hits. And so be part of the group with Bill Crowder. Mark Dehan, Elisa Morgan, and Daniel Ryan Day as they find help in Psalm 34 for When Crisis Strikes. And now the conclusion of this podcast about the impact of place with the group and Dr. Jack Beck. I can't remember a time when I wasn't a member of a Christian church. So... For 65 years, I've been part of a Christian community, but the the Christian community that I'm a member of today is very different than the church I was a member of, let's say, three, four decades ago. Mm -hmm. It's the same for me, but I don't have quite the same runway that (laughs) (laughs) that you have, Jack, but um, the church I grew up in, I'm in a very different setting now than I was then as well. Mm -hmm. I think about it a little bit differently, Jack. I think not just that I'm in a different place than I was then, but the places that I was in then are now different places than they were then. They've changed a lot Mm -hmm. over the ensuing years to where, I mean, I remember as a young pastor, three days a week, it was coat and tie. And and what a blessed day it was when (laughs) I was told, hey, you know, you don't have to wear that tie anymore, man. I was pretty excited about that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think there are some ways in which the church has remained absolutely a constant, you know, Mm. its beliefs, um, its sacraments, the Lord's Supper, baptism, you know, those things just continue. But there are other ways in which the church it really has to be nimble and respond to cultural need and cultural norms in order to continue to be relevant. And that doesn't change our core commitment to Christ. Like some have moved from hymns to worship choruses, or some have moved from being in person to virtual meetings. You know, so th- there is a an amazing wave, you know, from the New Testament forward of how the church just continues to be the church, but maybe expresses itself differently. Well, you know, the idea of a changing church 
uh, is one that's really strongly embedded right in the heart of the New Testament. Uh, the story of the early church is a story of struggles and changes that had to occur. And uh, the story that I'd like to look at today is a story about change in the early church. I would argue it's probably one of the most dramatic changes that had to occur within the early church. Uh, so dramatic that I call it the Pentecost Two story. <laughs> it's found in two chapters of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 10 and, uh, and chapter 11. And it's a story that's on the move geographically. I know I'm saying that early because Daniel will yell at me otherwise if I don't say geography <laughs> early. <laughs> it's a story that we're going to see on the move between the seaport of Joppa, the seaport of Caesarea Maritima on the coast, and a story that returns to Jerusalem. So it's the last in this series, so I thought we'd take on the challenge of not just looking at one place, but seeing how a story actually goes on the move between three locations. So this is the impact of places, not the impact of place. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, let's get started. Uh, it's a story that starts in the seaport of Joppa. And, uh, you know, every place sort of has qualities and characteristics about it. So when we hear that Peter has gone there, we we would do well to ask, what kind of place has he gone to? And I would suggest to you that Peter felt pretty at home Mm -hmm. in Joppa. It was a city that retained a lot of its Old Testament character, largely a Jewish population with whom Peter would share kind of way of thinking about and and doing life. It was a seaport. And remember, Peter was a fisherman. Mm -hmm. So there's some things about Joppa that are very attractive to him. And it's hard to imagine that he was at all interested in leaving because there was work to be done there. Remember, he is out there telling people that Jesus is the one that the Old Testament prophets told them to expect. And there was an audience in Joppa who needed to hear that. Well, do you remember what happened to him as he got hungry up on that rooftop? It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible because I love bacon and shrimp. (laughs) And bacon and shrimp came on the table in Acts chapter 10. Peter has a vision, and he has Mm -hmm. it three times of a sheet coming down with all the ceremonially unclean or the non-kosher foods, and he's told to eat, and he refuses, and God says, don't call common or unclean what I have cleansed. And uh, mm. and he has that vision just as some messengers are arriving at the house to find him. Yeah. So there's our Joppa part of the story. Mm-hmm. Peter feels no need to leave Joppa, but you've got three messengers who show up, and they're not Jewish, and they're not from Joppa. They're from Caesarea, about 32 miles to the north. And this story is about to go on the road. It's about to leave the seaport of Joppa for the seaport of Caesarea. And that means we have to again ask the question, so what's this place like? Mm -hmm. Well, there were some Jewish folks there, but by and large, it was a Gentile community. Herod the Great had built the place, and he had constructed it in a way that for all the world, it looked and felt and even smelled like Europe. (laughs) Herod loved Europe, and it was a place that had pagan temples. It was a place where you had the Roman military establishment in place. Uh, So uh, it isn't a place to which Peter was attracted because there was a rather modest Jewish audience there. And that was Peter's mindset. I'm going to take the news of forgiveness found in Jesus to a Jewish audience. So up in the seaport of Caesarea, a gentleman uh, by the name of Cornelius, who happened to be involved in the Roman military, not only a Gentile, but part of the occupying force of Europe in the land, had a vision. And Cornelius apparently was a God-fearer, someone who had come part way in understanding who God was and how he thought about him. Mm-hmm. And so the Lord gave him a vision and said, send down to uh, Joppa and bring Peter up. Now, as resistant as Peter might have been to the idea of going to Caesarea, I can only imagine that Cornelius was pretty resistant to the idea of having someone from Joppa come up to Caesarea to tell him more of the truth about who God was. Both of these men yielded (laughs) to the visions that we have, and suddenly we've got 
Jewish Joppa, Peter, meeting Gentile Cornelius from Caesarea. And when Peter gets there, uh, he walks into the large gathering that had assembled in the home of Cornelius, and he said, I am not at all comfortable about being here. And then Cornelius explains that he has sent the invitation as a result of a vision, and it's where we begin to see Peter changing. Uh, Peter then shares the gospel with them. He then sees the Spirit of God come on them in unique fashion, as he had seen in Jerusalem at Pentecost, and he baptizes them. Mm. And even though the language he uses to describe the event precedes slightly some of these other things, I think it's so powerful. Daniel, would you be so kind as to read it? It's in Acts 10, 34 and 35, because it really allows us to hear Peter tell us how he changed as a consequence of this experience. It says, then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Hmm. Wow. What do you see in that language of Peter? Well, just the way he starts, I truly understand. It's like this aha moment, Mm -hmm. this, uh, yeah, moment of new understanding. Yeah, the whole center of gravity for the New Testament story has shifted. Yeah, and it's happened in Peter, right? So Peter gets it. Mm-hmm. Now the story takes one more move, and that's in chapter 11, goes back to Jerusalem. And when the news of this gets to Jerusalem, it lands with this sort of audible thud <laughs> in the story. Mm-hmm. Do you hear it in the early verses of 11? Mm-hmm. They're like, Peter... <laughs> We need to talk about this because it just made sense to the Jewish Christian church in Jerusalem that the church was a Jewish Christian enterprise with a few Gentiles Mm -hmm. sprinkled in, but it wasn't seen as corporately reaching out to a place like Caesarea. So they, they call Peter on the carpet and say, hey, we heard that you were eating with Gentiles. And immediately that's like a trigger for the Jerusalem Mm -hmm. believers because they go, whoa, that's not what we do, Peter. That's not what we do. Uh, Explain yourself. And so we have Peter retelling the whole story that we've just lived in 10, retelling the whole story. But here's where it lands and where it lands. Oh my. Every time I read this story, I just feel a tremble go through me. I hope you have that experience too. Shall we share it together? Uh, It's in uh, chapter 11. Peter essentially says to them, look, I had exactly the same experience in Caesarea that we had in Jerusalem. I spoke the gospel. The Holy Spirit came, baptized people. Mm Mm-hmm. And so when they heard this, this is verse 18 of chapter 11, when they heard this, this is the church in Jerusalem, they had no further objections and praised God saying, so then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Hmm. I take it for granted. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what strikes me, Jack, is in these two chapters in Acts, Peter's shift within himself by the Holy Spirit's leading then leads to the church's shift that you see in verse 18. But in verse 17, Peter says, so if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who am I Mm. to think that I could stand in God's way? Mm. And I've had that experience myself. I've been at this table with everybody going, boy, I used to believe this way. And the Lord begins to show me through Mm. his word, hey, you know what? tweak it, Elisa. That's not what I'm saying. Move it over here. And and we move. Mm-hmm. And when we move, the church moves according to God's desires. And I'm sitting here listening to you and to Jack and thinking, what a different story it would have been if Peter would have sat there on the roof in Joppa and said, no, nope, I'm Pass. just not going there. <laughs> I mean, yeah. what? where are we yeah. if he had done that? Yeah, and if we feel that it's difficult as we're processing things that God's challenging with us, I mean, the fact that the story that Peter tells is repeated in detail instead of the author of Acts just going, Mm -hmm. you know what, I'll just say he retold them the story. Mm. Like, it was very difficult for Peter and for this early church to 
get their mind around what God was doing with Cornelius and his family. So the same way, when we end up at those spots where maybe a blind spot's being revealed or something we're struggling with or something that we're learning or maybe even feel like we're hearing for the first time, when it feels difficult within us to accept it, that doesn't mean that it's not from God. Sometimes even within that difficulty, that's how God is changing our perspective and the perspective of others as well. It's so good. I mean, it's so easy to become the church that is the chosen frozen. <laughs> and we just sit in that same spot yeah. and look at what the story does. By its very nature, it's a story on the move. It starts in Jerusalem. It moves to the seaport of Joppa. It moves to Caesarea and then it moves back to Jerusalem. It's a story on the move geographically. Mm. And it means that we have to be a church on the move, ready to change and become better than we were before. Yeah, some things about the church will never change, like our faith in Jesus Christ, but other things can and should change. It helped the early church to grow, and it'll help us grow today, too. Well, you're listening to the Discover the Word podcast with Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, Daniel Ryan Day, and our special guest, Dr. Jack Beck. Uh, Jack, thanks for spending these two podcasts with us, walking us through the material in the series, The Impact of Place. Location? Location, location. Yeah, we're convinced. And thanks for making the Bible's geography meaningful. Discover the Word is a small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries in Grand Rapids, Michigan, in which we invite you to walk with us through topics and passages that inform the way we read the scriptures, challenge us as we live our lives as followers of Christ, and always point us to discover Jesus in the pages of the Bible. Encourage you to explore other studies with the group on our discovertheword.org website. Well, these Bible studies on the Discover the Word podcast and all the resources Our Daily Bread Ministries is able to provide are made possible because grateful friends like you give voluntary donations to cover the costs. Your giving helps us make the life-changing story and wisdom of the Bible understandable and accessible to people all around the world. And so if you'd like to partner with us financially, go online to discovertheword.org and click the Donate tab to explore some of your options. All right, I'm Brian Hedinga. Thanks for studying with us. Discover the Word is provided by Our Daily Bread Ministries. 